Hey, what's up? This is JM, host of the Celebrity Grill podcast on iTunes, and you're listening to the Barbecue Central Radio Network. All barbecue and grilling, all the time. Yay! Let's go! Do it live. Do it live! I can, I'll write it and we'll do it live! So to get that perfect barbecue, you use wood. Are you sure it's safe? Whatever. We put the lighter fluid on, strike the match, and... Oh. Should we call the fire department? That might be a good idea. Welcome to the Really Big Barbecue Central Show. This is a show that talks about all things important to the world of barbecue and grilling. Originating from the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame city of Cleveland, Ohio, the barbecue capital of the North Coast. I'm your program host, Greg Rempe. Happy to have you aboard here on your Tuesday evening live fire fun and frivolity show. You want to jump in tonight? More than happy to have you. You can do it via the phone call. You can do it via the email, both and or neither. But here's how you do it. You can get in touch with the show by calling 216-220-0966. Email Greg at the BBQCentralShow.com. On the Twitter and Instagram, said BBQ Central Show. Anything else you want to find out about the show can be found at the main website, the BBQ Central Show.com. And here's what's happening coming up in about 12 minutes from now. He is a semi recurring guest, somebody who has tracked back through the history of this show, maybe a decade at this point, maybe even longer as I start to think about it. Uh, originally part of the gaggle of dudes from Hot Grill on Grill Action with something that they used to bring in tow to them to barbecue competitions called the Flabongo, and we'll leave it at that, do your own research, and has since made quite a name for himself, still in the live fire sector, but more in the niche of pizza, and you know, Goddamn well who I'm talking about from Urban Slicer. It is Matt Frampton rejoining the show at 14 past the hour. And we will talk to Matt about how 2020 ended up. The launch of the uh, the pizza doughs. Which as we were sound checking yesterday, I said, man, you know, you think of all the pizza doughs. Have there been any like real pizza doughs that have hit the market you know, and I'm not talking about that Chef Boyardi crap or uh, there's probably some other mass market. But this is real ass pizza dough that you can get in these nice little packets. And all you have to do is add a cup of warm water and away you go. You do the little rise portion, uh, the mix. As with anything, if it's something that I can do successfully... Everybody else can do it. I'm as unhandy, as unsmart as it comes, and I seem to have no trouble with any of the doughs. The Neo is more my style, uh, the one that I like a lot, but all of them are very good. And it was shocking to me the success that he has had with a, in essence, two-ingredient dough. Uh, The dry stuff in the mixer, then the cup of warm water, Mix it for eight minutes, let it rise or proof or whatever the terminology is. Make sure it's round when you make the dough ball and then you have the setup for a round pizza and then four hours later, undo it from the container and away you go. It's really some of my favorite product of 2020. And then we will showcase this segment by talking about the pizza sauce that was introduced towards the latter part of 2020. And hands down, it is easily my favorite pizza sauce that i have ever had period and i'm we have some pretty established pizza joints here in cleveland believe it or not and this is easily my favorite i would perhaps suggest pitching it around to some of the other pizza places here in cleveland so they can use it it might make me like their pizza even better but i like mine a lot and it's really thanks to matt and his products over at urban slicer so a big talk up for matt 
He deserves it, and looking forward to catching up with him. Then 35 past the hour. It is the fourth Tuesday of the month, so that's going to bring a visit from regular guest Derek Riches from DerekRiches.com. And we have a number of reporter-esque topics to hit on and talk about, not the least of which was one of my guests last week, which was Ben West from Sparks Grill. So we'll talk to Derek about Spark and see if he's heard about that. There's some other things that we'll get to as well during his segment. And they'll move to the second hour, and it is, of course, the fourth Tuesday, as I had mentioned. And that means in the second hour, a refire of the embedded correspondence, which everybody loves. And everybody has an agenda tonight. So I have my three or four topics that I want to hit. And then we will go to Douglas, and then we will go to John, then we'll go to Rusty, as time permits, and uh, plow through our respective agendas. They're all separate. They're all unique. So we have a lot of ground to cover in the second hour, so we will jump right to it. So that's how it sets up this evening. Coming up in a few short minutes, Matt Frampton from Urban Slicer, 35 past the first hour, Derek Riches from DerekRiches.com, and 14 past the second hour, the embedded correspondence. 35 past as well. 216-220-0966. Greg at the BBQ Central Show.com. If you want to jump in, don't forget you can follow me socially. Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, and Snapchat at BBQ Central Show. Facebook and Twitch have live video streams, and you can find those at slash BBQ Central Show. Also a live video stream over on YouTube, which is slash R D Rempy. Going through the listener feedback of mail. Many of you enjoyed the new product talk last week. I just alluded to it a second ago. A lot of you enjoyed the Spark Grill segment and were intrigued with the grill itself, the aesthetics and how it looked, and how it is set to operate. Many folks wrote me over the course of the week going, man, I'm really interested in this grill. Do you have one that you're secretly testing that you can tell me all about it? I don't. Many of you, for as pumped up as you were about the Spark Grill and the fact that it ran off of this proprietary charcoal brick, you were also concerned with the price of their (laughs) proprietary fuel source, but you did like the fact that you could use regular charcoal in place of the brick if you didn't want to use it. Or if you decided against the Spark Grill Fuel option altogether, you can still use traditional charcoal. We'll get more in-depth into the uh, second hour with the embedded correspondence on that. Uh, Also with Derek Riches, as as I had mentioned. So the Spark Grill really hitting the mark. Also, a lot of you did appreciate the conversation that I had with Mendel over at the Meat Stick. Is that, you know, a lot of you guys are looking for that wireless meat thermometer, temperature probe, remote thermometering thing. I'm still not sold on this whole Wi-Fi connectivity and the ability to use it through a phone and any internet connection that I can currently do with my Fireboard. Now, the Fireboard is not wireless by any stretch of the imagination, but it sets up very easily. I get all the distance in the world that I want as long as I'm on the Wi-Fi network. And it's accurate, has a great user interface, uh, both on the computer and on the telephone. So we'll see how these continue to evolve over the weeks and months. Uh, But Mendel was a great guest last week, so if you missed it, go ahead and get the podcast. Kevin in Georgia writes, Greg, Stephen Reichlin sounded so good last week during his segment. Maybe my favorite segment to date that he has done. How about that? Kevin, thank you. Eric in Pennsylvania wrote in. Greg Steven sounded great last Tuesday. Did he say you provided it for him, that setup? Like you bought it for him? Why wouldn't he go out and buy it himself? I'm pretty sure he can cover that given his book sales and TV shows that he referenced during the segment. Why, just this past Tuesday. Certainly he can afford a proper audio setup as a guest. Uh, Eric, I'm sure he can. But... He didn't ask me for my input on a audio rig. In 2021, as I had mentioned, perhaps in some sub circles, was going to be the year that the Barbecue Central show demanded the best sound from its guest. I have laid the groundwork 
I've earned the reputation, and now I will do whatever I can to hold my guests to task to match my quality sound as many times as possible through this year. I have developed a brand new letter that I am attaching with new guests that have USB mic suggestions weeks in advance so they can set up. And then for my recurring guests, now look, Malcolm and uh, Susie Bullock and some of these other folks already have really nice audio setups because they're into that kind of a thing or they do a podcast already like the Embedded Correspondents. But some of the other folks just did it. So we've, uh, you know, Sam the Cooking Guy stepped up his game. I bought some stuff for Stephen Reichlin, some of the other recurring guests that didn't have it. I want everybody to sound really good. So a little expenditure will pay off in the long run. I can tell you this, Matt Frampton is geared up to the hilt. He will sound excellent as well. Continuing sound in 2021. I'll talk to you quickly about Pits and Spits. Since 1983, Pits and Spits has been handcrafting smokers and grills in Houston, Texas. Within that time, they have established itself as one of the premier brands in high-quality offset smokers and more recently pellet cookers. Setting itself apart by using heavy 7 and 10 gauge stainless steel in every cooker, fully welded construction that you can feel when you use the unit, and 304 stainless steel roll top lids and front shelves on every single smoker. So why does it matter? Well, by using higher quality materials, pits and spit smokers reach and maintain temperatures, allowing you to worry more about the meat than the heat. By providing a fully welded smoker, you don't have to worry about grease and smoke leaking out of the barrel or the grill rattling apart as you move it through the backyard. And by using 304 stainless, you're getting an heirloom quality product that you can pass down to your kids if you want. Now, where some companies are focusing on being the low-cost provider, Pits and Spits focuses on craftsmanship, using quality materials. Are there cheaper ways to make these things? Sure. They don't like tack welds, cheap stainless, electronics that you can't trust. Having in-house manufacturing gives them complete control over the design and standards. Their steel suppliers supply material that can be used in some of the harshest environments around, so it's going to perform in all conditions, no matter where you live. And their controllers are made right here in the States. They have unimpeded transparency into the programming. Pits and Spits has a dealer network across the country. If there isn't one close to you, breathe easy. Give Koi a call to shop, 844-650-6250. Whether you're a backyard grill master or competition team, Pits and Spits has a product for you. You can check them out at pitsandspits.com, all spelled out. Or see their pits in the wild across social media with their handle, at Pits and Spits. Who's gearing up for pizza talk besides me, everybody? Matt Frampton is the pizziola of the world. And he's right here on this show in just a few short minutes. Stick around. We'll be right back. You're listening to the number one most downloaded barbecue and grilling podcast anywhere. The Barbecue Central Show. Casting live from the Barbecue Central Show studios in Cleveland, Ohio. You're listening to the Barbecue Central Show. Once again, here's your host, Greg Rempe. Hey, this portion of the show being brought to you by the Barbecue Guru, creators of automatic pit temperature control technology, sellers of ceramic cookers with built-in power draft fans, accessories. To make your barbecue and grilling life easier, visit bbqguru.com for more information or call them at 800-288-GURU. The Barbecue Guru continuing to be a breakthrough in barbecue technology. All right, who doesn't love a good pizza? Pound for pound, pizza, my singular most favorite food ever. Even the worst pizza in my book is some pretty good pizza. Joining me tonight in the leadoff is the foremost live fire pizza cooking authority in the industry, and he happens to be a friend of the show as well. So without further ado, we race to the hotline and welcome back friend of the show, Matt Frampton. Hey, Matt. Dude, what's going on, my man? How are you? I am doing very well. Appreciate you joining me here this evening as we get ready for some fabulous in-depth pizza talk. Uh, before we get into some specific new products and uh, outlooks of 2021 and so forth, how, in your opinion, do you think the high heat P 
pizza industry is feeling right now? Oh, the pizza industry has never been hotter. It's it's been uh, you know growing over many years, but with everyone cooking at home right now, and uh, most of 2020 with what happened there. It's just exploded. I've I've spoken to quite a few pizza oven make- makers, and they had record years. So it's been a cool year for the pizza space for sure. Do you see growing 2021? Is this going to be perhaps the biggest year that pizza itself has ever seen? I don't think there's any doubt about it. It's just there, there's no signs of it slowing down. Uh, the first month of the year for us has been really good. And, uh, and from what I've heard from others, it's, it's been great too. So pretty awesome. Matt Frampton joining me here on the show, Matt, I'm getting the question in the instant chat, of course, uh, any relation to Peter, man, no. And the people that even know about Peter, it's just a dying breed. I used to be able to walk up to, uh, the checkout lane and say Frampton. They say, how do you spell it? I say like Peter. And now they just look at me cross-eyed. It's crazy. Like they have no idea who Peter but, Frampton yeah. is. Yeah, they have no idea. Wow. Even just ten short years ago, when I know you mentioned, I think it has been about a decade since we started doing this together on the show and the the twelve days of barbecue and yes. all that stuff with the hot. Yeah. Uh, anyway, if you don't know who Peter Frampton is, just YouTube Peter Frampton. I, I would recommend go immediately. Peter Frampton, do you feel like we do live, and then settle in for roughly fifteen minutes as he makes a guitar talk and. It's one of the most, it's one of my favorite, uh, I think it's my most favorite Peter Frampton. Do you have a favorite Peter Frampton song, Matt? Uh, I like the whole Frampton Comes Alive album. And he and he actually invented the talk box, which is a super cool tool uh, for guitar players. So yeah, check it out, man. He's a, a legendary artist for sure. No doubt. Uh, all right, Matt. So the pizza dough came out last year. We did a segment on the show about it to really pitch it hard because it was something that you were believing in. I wanted to get behind it. And all I heard after it hit the market, people started consuming it, was how great it was. Rave reviews uh, that I heard from many top men and women in the industry. So from a business standpoint, uh, and for Urban Slicer specifically, did 2020 close for you uh, way above expectation? Or did you uh, about meet expectation? How did it work for you specifically? Oh, oh my God. I I way beyond my wildest dreams, honestly. I had... A goal, a stretch goal, and our first month, I think we quadrupled the stretch goal. Wow. And 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 it's all thanks to people like you who believed in us from the beginning. Um, I always believed in the product, but, you know, you got to get it out there, get it in front of people. And it, the adoption rate's been crazy. Um, very busy in a very, very good way. Uh, we're we're uh, coming up on 150 stores in Canada, the U.S., Germany, Australia, and uh, some really cool things coming, some new products. But the the pizza dough will always be the the heart and soul of our company, and and the feedback so far has been so cool. What do you attribute the overwhelming acceptance into the market? I mean, when you talk about goals and stretch goals, and then mention that you quadrupled the stretch goal, I mean that is a pretty significant overshoot. So, is there one or two things that you can point to that say? You know, this is why these products were so readily accepted? Uh, well, I think the quality of the product, once people got it, and I sent out a lot of samples, I mean, once people got it in their hands and tried it out, they realized how simple it is to make world-class pizza at home by using our mixes. And there was just a gap in the, the space on the shelf. There wasn't really a high-quality item. You had Jiffy, you had Chef Boy RD, and some of these other mixes that don't don't use the same types of ingredients like we do um the barbecue network and family that i've had this this will be our 16th year competing so at this point we're kind of a mainstay um but just you know all all those guys that i've met over the year have over the years have stores and they took a chance and started carrying our products and word of mouth spread really quickly and uh, i'm I mean, after all this, we've spent zero dollars on marketing so far, which is just insane. Wow. Um, it's been word of mouth and uh, just the, you know, our awesome network of barbecue family. Matt Frampton joining me here on the show. UrbanSlicerPizza.com is the website. If you haven't been there to check out the products, go ahead and do that while we're talking. So near the end of 2020, Matt, the pizza sauce also hits the market. And I've told you off the air many times, this has to be the most 
delicious, best tasting, pizza friendly sauce. And this is coming from somebody who fancies himself a sauce aficionado. So I don't know if there's anything on the market that's better than this. But first off, congratulations on this product specifically. And second, is this your original recipe, something that you had worked on, and this is the, the Matt Frampton original recipe on my shelf? This is our Urban Slicer pizza sauce. It oh. has no sugar. It's made with all California tomatoes, which that's where you get all the sweetness from. Um, the ingredients are super high quality. And, I man, thank you so much for the kind words. I, I'm a sauce kind of you know snob myself as well. I, I loved it from the second we started and it's cool it's in a it's in a can so it's a little bit of a throwback look versus a jar or bottle that you're seeing some of the things in and yeah i love it the look taste everything about it i'm really happy with it and i think a lot of people are too it's been cool what kind of a product genesis does this take from start to getting it into sellable form well, the pizza dough mixes, we were testing for a little over three years, um, and I have an 18-month shelf life on it. So my first blend uh, that is exactly what's in the Neapolitan bag, I got in April of 2019. And back in November, I opened it up, mixed it. I had held it for 18 months to make sure it still worked, and it worked great. Huh. So it's been a really long time. We launched in June of 2020, but... Uh, behind the scenes, it's, it has been many years of, of uh, testing and sampling and all that. Uh, what about the sauce? Is that something that comes pretty quick then? Uh, no, the sauce we've been working on for a long time as well. Um, the, you know, the hardest thing there is finding someone to can it for you. And uh, you know, we've got some, some good connections and secrets there that we'll just keep to ourselves at Herb and Slicer. But it's... Uh, Definitely a lot of work um, on the sauce side. It's much different than a dry mix, uh, and and we do it at a different company than we do our dry mixes, but they've been great. As you're sourcing a dry mix company or a sauce company in this instance, is it a is it a pretty long process, or are, do you get a lot of input from folks that are in a barbecue sauce business and maybe it's similar enough where they would give you recommendations for you at least start or is it just a lot of cold calling to get that relationship going so i was fortunate enough i did no cold calling so i i did work with several people to do sampling um lots of different tests pricing was a big part of it uh but all of the people that we started with and and put out for bid uh were recommended by someone and so that was good. We wanted to start with a relationship and uh, someone that also believed in what we were attempting to do and was willing to kind of work with us because it's, it's a lengthy process. And uh, hats off to all the scientists and everyone that we worked with at both companies. They helped us a ton. What about new products in 2021? Anything going to be hitting the shelves at some point? Or is this one of those uh, would love to tell you, but we're not legally allowed to release any information? I can tell you that I can legally say some things. All right. Uh, we, we definitely have some products coming. Um, don't have any release dates for anything yet, but we will have uh, some more dough flavors. And those, a couple of them are getting pretty close. One of them will be a dessert, which is going to be pretty cool. We've got a couple of seasonings, and I'm really excited about them. And uh, perhaps some other things that are a little further down the timeline, but I'm very excited about as well. Everything will continue to be geared towards making pizza, making at home a top-notch, fun, and super simple experience for you know the, the everyday person that doesn't want to spend as many hours as, as I do. <laughs> do you can you attribute some of the success of the Urban Slicer products? To the pandemic, I mean, we talk a, a lot about the live fire space, you know, outside of restaurants and even some restaurants seem to at least survive. Some of them, you know, I've heard from some owners saying, hey, it, it sucks being in the pandemic, but it actually forced us to pivot a little bit. And now we're actually a little leaner, but we're way meaner, more profitable than we were. So as they start to see a return to normal they're probably not going to go back to what it used to look like for them because of how they're operating now and able to get along. But a lot of people were staying home. Grill sales were through the roof. Charcoal sales through the roof. Uh, people just cooking mm. for themselves more because a lot of restaurants uh, weren't a lot. You weren't allowed to eat out or, or do what you were 
used to doing uh, before all of this happened. So uh, can you attribute some of that success to people staying home and just wanting to cook? Oh, yeah, I, timing has been, you know, just kind of dumb luck on our end. And I think, you know, to be successful, you have to set yourself up, but you also need some luck. And, and when you're starting a new business, even more so, um, you know, when we started this and still right now, it's, it's quote unquote, my side hustle. I have a, a career that I've been in for 25 years that has, you know, up until March 12th, the last year, tra- traveling all over the place, 75% of the time and not having to travel, uh, the remainder of 2020, uh, gave me the ability you know, in the evenings to work on this and be super dedicated to it and not being on an airplane or in a hotel room away from, from Omaha where I'm from. And so, uh, you know, for me, the pandemic has been a blessing for this business. And, uh, you know, I'm a glass half full kind of person. And I just grabbed the moment and, and took it um, along with my partners and took advantage. And and here we are. But for sure, it has been, uh, you know, for us, it's been a, a benefit. All right, man. So let's go ahead and do a little pizza talk here uh, before we jump into some specifics. Let me ask you to uh, maybe re-explain this term, pizziola and how one goes about earning that designation. Yeah, so, you know, technically anyone who cooks pizza professionally is a pizziola. Um, I specifically am a graduate of the International School of Pizza, which, you know, it's uh, there's, there's a small amount of people that have graduated from it. It's a, kind of a nostalgic group. Um, they have a world pizza team, which I'd love to cook on someday. But uh, it's, it's really anyone who cooks professionally. So y- you could, uh, anyone who has a, their own pizzeria um, or has a pizza company. How important do you think having that designation is for you and for the business? Do you think it puts you over the top in any specific way? Or, you know, if, if people read it on a news release or a resume you're elevated? I mean, obviously you are because you have it, but do you think it's really cashing in for you at any point? Tough to say. I, you know, I, I, it's definitely not hurting. Um, it gives you some clout, you know, it proves that you're, you're in it. Um, you're dedicated, uh, that you have put the time in, but I have been building this, as you know, I've been building this up for many years. And I, you know, I think a lot of the people that are buying the products, from us could probably take it or leave it. I mean, it, I don't think it, it um, impacted their decision to buy from us one way or the other. Getting into new companies, and we're going to get into the food service side, that is something that will help us a lot because I can sell um, our ability to increase profits and improve you know, their, their frozen pizza discs that they're you know, doing mass quantities of and get them a professional pizza on their menu so things like that, that'll help a, a lot there. And, and the school I studied for eight days in an actual restaurant, which was cool, you know, and having not come from a restaurant background, that was invaluable for me. Uh, Matt, the Deep Dish Detroit brand is going to get a, a bit of a rebrand. We talked about it last night while we were sound checking, and uh, perhaps there was a little a brand confusion or, you know, just Deep Dish confusion in general. So uh, tell me a little bit about the rebrand and, and what you can expect. Yeah, sure. I mean, so this is part of business, right? And we launched it. Super excited about the Detroit Deep Dish. I'm very passionate about it. Love that style. It's going through a renaissance. Um, but there was some pushback, you know, from people from Chicago. And there was these other deep dish pizzas, the Sicilian style, a grandma style. And our mix works for all of them. And so we have decided that we're going to rebrand it. It'll, it'll become Epic Deep Dish. And, uh, and, and that just, you know, essentially it, we're going to, uh, highlight the fact that you can do all the different styles with it and have a big marketing push excited to show a bunch of videos we'll do around how you can do uh, cast iron Chicago or the traditional deep dish, uh, stuffed crust Chicago or a Sicilian or a focaccia with it. You can do all these different things. And, um, so yeah, we're, we're going to be rebranding that and, uh, take the regionality out of it. What is a Lloyd pan, and do I want one if I'm a pizza guy? You absolutely want one. Okay. Um, there are <laughs> so uh, uh, Lloyd Pans is a company. They sell all different styles of pans, um, from pizza making to cake baking 
and they sell all those regional different types of pizzas that I just rattled off. They sell a pan for all of those, but they come pre-seasoned with a uh, release sort of coating on it, so you don't need to do anything to the pan. You you get it, put your dough in there, cook your pizza, done. <laughs> and from my perspective, it's the best on the market. I have had one for many, many years. It looks exactly like it did when it was brand new other than a little extra seasoning. Is there a, a best size of Lloyd pan to get for your dough specifically? For the deep dish, I'm a big fan of the 8x10 if you want rectangle, so you can do two 8x10s if you want, uh, out of one pouch. If you want to make one big one, it's a 10x14. On our packaging, we also note that you can do a square pizza, either 8x8 or 9x9. And I just got my hands on these, what they're calling long pans, and they're 18 inch long by four and a half wide, and you can make two of those out of one pouch as well. Mm. And if you go out to my Instagram or YouTube or whatever, all my social media, you'll see a video I just put out recently in a uh, uh, where I made it my hangover pizza, which is a breakfast pizza. And I did it in that long pan, and it's man, I love them, super cool. When I'm I'm gonna recommend them to a couple different restaurants that are looking at our stuff to roll them out as an appetizer. It's, it's got a great presentation to it. Matt, when you're dressing a pie, what is the... <laughs> mm, I don't know if best or right, but is there a most advantageous amount of sauce to put on a pie? Or does it depend on crust and stuff like that? There's a most advantageous amount yes. and a most advantageous time. Uh-huh. So on a, on a Neapolitan-style pizza, it's kind of the less is more. Um, sort of theory with that one you don't want a bunch of toppings it'll get soggy and especially sauce and you don't want a real watery sauce so our sauce which you've had in the can it's pretty thick you could thin it out if you wanted to but it's thick on purpose um, for that reason so it's so it's versatile Um, if you're doing a pan pizza it's a little more forgiving you can use a little more sauce if you're doing a deep dish uh, like like we do with our deep dish blend then the preference is to add the sauce to the top of the pizza after you bake it. So it has no opportunity to seep into that crust, and it stays light, airy, crispy, almost fried texture on the outside, and then you add the sauce to the top. Can we address fresh mozzarella just for a second? Because from what I have found, they can be small landmines, and what I mean is, they melt, but it seems like they also will uh, puke out some liquid, and, and in the middle you have a soupy pie that you, perhaps you weren't accounting for. Yeah, great question. A lot of people confuse fresh fresh mozzarella with whole milk as well, and whole milk mozz doesn't necessarily have to be fresh. It can be a block, and the, the whole milk versus a part skim will be more melty. It's got more fat content in it. The fresh mozz has a lot of water, and so that's why you get that. That's a great explanation, that you, the landmine. Mm-hmm. So you got to go thinner, and a tip to make it less watery is to slice, put it out on some paper towels for a few hours, and then use it, and that'll cut back a little bit. But, yeah, too much too much uh, fresh mozzarella, and you'll have a soupy pie, no doubt. <laughs> uh, so outside of, let's say, a Green Mountain Grill pizza oven insert or some other kind of high-heat pizza oven, is there a – an outside of the box way that you specifically like to do a pizza? Well, if you have just a conventional oven, then there's what's called the two stone method. So pizza stones are really helpful. If you're going to do a Neapolitan pizza, raise your rack all the way up, put a stone on it and then another rack right below that and another stone and then cook the pizza in between the two. And you kind of simulate a brick oven. You're only going to be 500 or 550, whatever your oven goes to. But I'm also a fan of, Uni has the new Coda 16. It's it's a lot bigger than their original Uni. It's it's got a lot of real estate. Super cool. Kettle Pizza makes an insert for a gas grill, and it's essentially just a stainless steel hood with a um, stone below it, and that actually cooks a really really mean Neapolitan style pizza. Hmm. So those are all options. You can do it right on your grill. We have our outdoor grilling dough that's intended to be cooked right on top of a live fire, or it can just be done um, on a, any pellet cooker if you want it right on the grate or on a stone. Um, so lots of different options. 
and uh, we have some videos and directions on how to do uh, all those variations. Yeah, so you want to go over to urbanslicerpizza.com. You can check out all of the uh, videos on how-tos, and then, of course, more importantly, you can go order all of those products so you can make these great pizzas as well. I suggest ordering all the products, and then once they arrive at your house, go to the instructional videos, watch those, and uh, it really has everything you need to be successful uh, right from the get-go. We're talking with Matt Frampton from Urban Slicer Pizza. Again, the website, Urban Slicer Pizza. Dot com Matt, always appreciate the time and continued success, man. You're killing it. Man, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Always. Can't wait till next time. You got it. There he is, Matt Frampton from Urban Slicer Pizza. Again, the website, UrbanSlicerPizza.com, and grab the doughs and the sauce. Uh, I would just said, you know what? I'm, I, you know, Sterling Ball called me one day and he said, Have you tried Matt's pizza sauce? I said, I, it's like right on the top of my head, and I haven't pulled the trigger yet. He's like, I'm going to wait on the phone while you order it. It's that good. You have to get it. So when I was ordering, I just ordered the box of 12. I threw caution to the wind, and uh, I know I will use it. I know that. I suggest doing the same. Let me talk to you quickly about B&B Charcoal before we get to Derek Riches, who is warming in the green room. Not all charcoal is created equal. First and foremost, charcoal is a heat source. You want to look for the most efficient way to cook outdoors. Second is the taste and appearance benefit that charcoal can give your food. Third is the health and safety considerations for you and your equipment. The two main types of charcoal are lump and briquettes. The key difference between lump charcoal and charcoal briquettes is that lump is 100% natural wood. Briquettes are made from wood byproducts and additives. Quality food comes from quality ingredients. Fuel is the last ingredient, but it is the taste you perceive when eating. Choosing the right fuel source can make all the difference. It's very important to use the best quality charcoal when you cook because it is both a heat source and a flavor source. But what is the difference and which ones should you be using? We've talked about it here on this show. Go back to the archives and search Ed Riley from B&B Charcoal and listen to us talk about lump and briquettes. I say this. If you're going to do overnight, you're going to do something along those lines, go briquette. If you want something a little higher heat or you don't want to deal with the ash, go lump. Or sometimes, like when I'm using pit barrel, I do both. Combination of both works really well. bbcharcoal.com is the website. You can check it out, see all the products. I suggest going to your local Ace and finding it there, bbcharcoal.com. That's bbcharcoal.com. And we are back with Derek Riches right after this. Stick around. We'll be right back. Howard Stern, Jim Rome, Dan Patrick, and Greg Rampey. The Mountain Rushmore of talk show entertainment. Now, let's get back to the Barbecue Central Show. This portion of the show being brought to you by CookinPellets.com, your number one source for quality wood pellets for all your pellet-driven cookers. You can go to CookinPellets.com to purchase or look at all of the other information and products that they have over there. If you'd like to purchase from Amazon.com, you can do that as well. I recommend cookingpellets.com first and then go to the other websites after that. It is the fourth Tuesday of the month, and that means we go to the hotline and welcome in the most respected barbecue journalist in the biz, friend of show, Derek Riches. Hey, Derek. Hey, Greg. How you doing? I am fabulous. Appreciate you making time for the show this month as always, and we have some items to get to here this evening. The first one I wanted to start out with is a conversation that I had with a guy named Ben West last week, who was from Spark Grill. And uh, I saw it towards the end of, like right towards the end of 2020. Somebody sent me an Instagram uh, ad and I saw the quick write up on it. It seemed catchy enough. It had a unique aesthetic to it. And then as I started to dig in a little bit more, well, here's a, thermostatically controlled cooking device. It's uh, not like a pellet cooker because it's using this specialty charcoal brick in lieu of the charcoal brick from somebody I touched base with on Instagram. 
It can also use, I guess, regular charcoal briquettes or regular lump charcoal. The lighting is a little bit different because the brick that they make is obviously engineered to go hand in hand with the whole lighting process. But from an outsider's looking in, it seemed interesting enough. And uh, Ben is very, uh, let's say, aggressive with what he would like to do. He had mentioned Peloton and IPO and things of these natures. So uh, having done a, a successful EcoZoom business previous to this, not the same space, but startup and right. you know selling for multi millions, blah blah blah. Uh, I don't know if he caught that windfall or you know if that was just numbers being thrown about. Uh, then he gets into the Spark Grill space and is offering a thermostatically charcoal fired cooker to the market. What do you know about it, and what do you think the real life expectancy of something like this is? Uh, I did get a chance to try one of these out once. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, it's it it's the sort of product that, that looks like it comes out of a design lab. It's, you know, it's got a clean aesthetic to it. It's pretty basic, straightforward grill. But then it's got that added layer of technology. And everyone seems to think that that technology is necessary these days. It doesn't have a lot of the versatility in my opinion, that you might get with like a PK grill or, you know, even a Weber kettle. Uh, and the thing that really gets me is it's like, okay, it will use other charcoal, but it's optimized for their charcoal. Sure. And that's not readily available. This becomes kind of a mail order proposition right now and, and probably would remain so for a very long time. So, I, I don't like that idea. I don't like the, you know, here's a product, but you're going to have to buy all your fuel from us if you're going to want it to work as we say it will work. Plus it's 750 bucks. There's so much competition. You know, I mean, you're into Kamado market space. You're into, you know, uh, your past kind of master built gravity feed. And um, I don't know. I would there's a market for it. It's it's an upscale market. It's a sharper image sort of thing, but uh, I wouldn't spend the money for it myself. Can we not compare it to a pellet cooker because pellets are readily available fuel source pretty much wherever you go at this point? Uh, yeah. I mean, I, th I think that that does become an apple and orange proposition. Is it a, is it a better question for me to ask you if these fuel bricks were readily available that would potentially give you a different mindset or evaluation or not necessarily? Not necessarily. Hmm. Not at the price point that it's at, because I think that, I mean, if you bought another $700, $800 charcoal grill, you're, you're going to get more versatility out of it. And you versatility know, point, from like it, a, a two zone fire type thing or like, well, how, two, how are you saying yeah. versatility or what do you mean by well, versatility? Yeah. Two zone fire. Uh, I, th I think that it struggles on the lower end a bit. Um, and you know, I mean, when you're talking about like a kettle or a big green egg, your accessories are unlimited and this is all coming from one company. So it's kind of what they develop and what they're going to accessorize with that you're going to be dependent on. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's an interesting idea, but I, I wouldn't invest in it myself. Are you familiar with any gas grills that are thermostatically controlled in the market? Like, have there been attempts or do you know any that are coming down the pike? Uh, well, actually several years ago, Charbroil came out with Smart Chef. A uh, gas grill, which was an app enabled gas grill. You could uh, make some adjustment to it. You couldn't, you know, you couldn't start it. You couldn't shut it down remotely, but you could make adjustments from a distance. Uh, they did an initial factory run on it. It did not catch on. I think it was $600, $700, somewhere in that price range. Um, and it just kind of had issues. Mm. They didn't have the app development in there. I think they were really trying to jump into this technology space and didn't do a lot of the backup work. I mean, Charbroil has been kind of struggling for several years now to kind of figure out where they are and what they're doing. And, uh, 
Yeah. So that's an attempt there. Um, you know, when you go to the very high end, Lynx has a product which is app enabled gas grill, allows you to control temperatures, burners, all that sort of stuff from remotely. So it's, it's there. It's just not, I just, you know, it's kind of like putting a remote on your microwave. It's kind of like, what are you getting from it? You know, but when you primarily going to be doing hot and fast cooking, having that kind of functionality, you know, how far do we want to take this? Uh, Derek, know? Derek Rich is joining me from DerekRiches.com. You can read all of his writings on this industry over there. And you can see him here on the fourth Tuesday of every month of barbecue central show. Uh, Derek Weber appears and you can maybe help me out on this changing their business model. Now, what I'm about to tell you is coming from a first hand account from somebody that I know who used to be affiliated with the show. And I didn't realize this, but evidently there are, let's call them subcontractors that uh, work for Weber that cover regions of the country, I guess, to help set Weber up as a deal. So what I'm, what I'm understanding perhaps is, uh, you know, John from so-and-so's grill store in wherever calls into Weber, says, I would like to know how to become a dealer. And then customer service fields that and then turns it around to one of these uh, perhaps handful yeah. of companies across the country and says, hey, mm -hmm. this is in your region. Go call them and see if they meet our criteria. Uh, it appears that they are at least backing out of uh, one of those people out there in the southeast called the Armstrong Agency, which is based in Atlanta, and, and that really yeah. much uh, they are solely dependent on setting up Weber dealers and uh, servicing them and stuff like that. Uh, Weber has informed them that their relationship is going to be terminating within the next few weeks. Is this something that you know that perhaps is just specific to them, or are they pulling out of this kind of a setup and, and going somewhere differently down the road? Well, I reached out to someone at Tri-State that I know down here in Texas, and they handle, you know, this market space. This is kind of, this is the way things used to be. And that was you were a manufacturer, you had your product, and you sent it to distri distributors who carried a lot of products, distributed them very widely, you know, in their region. And uh, that's how you got your product to the small time retailers. And as we've gotten more big box, these sort of distribution networks aren't as important as they used to be and uh, don't serve the same purpose they used to. Uh, a lot of these distributor companies, I mean, it's like Tri-State here, they do all sorts of, you know, kitchen design and professional cooking equipment and all that sort of stuff. So, uh you know, this is one of their products. I know they're also the regional distributor for like Big Green Egg. Um, so I don't know that they're changing that. Uh, Weber has been in a corporate transition now for a while. Um, you know, they, I think it, you had Kevin Coleman on your show and he said, well, Weber's a technology company. We're not really a grill company. And uh, that's kind of seems to be the attitude they have these days. I don't know how much they'll change in distribution. Um, I know that they, in actuality, they just signed a contract with a distributor in the Middle East, which covers Saudi Arabia and the mm -hmm. Emirates and several uh, countries in that region. So I think what they're doing is they're going from the smaller distributor networks to larger ones just to cut down the number they have. But I also know that they sold uh, one of their major production facilities in Illinois, the one that's out by O'Hare, for $40 million and then leased it back. And what I assume is, is that they were liquidating assets for their purchase of June, mm. which allows them to take the June technology in-house so they're not dependent on a third party for you know, the technology for their technology company. Right. This makes them a much more compact and unit there it's a better package and you know i said last time i think weber's for sale right and i think this is just a continuation in that direction they're cutting ties to things that might be considered a, a, a weak link you dovetailed it on your own saying that you had mentioned at the end of last year that you thought weber was lining up to sell 
I've heard rumors that perhaps one of those companies as a potential suitor, and it kind of blew my mind when somebody had pitched it to me, was Traeger. Does that make any sense to you? I don't think so. The Traeger's primary investors are Trilantic Private Equity out of Florida. Uh, Jeremy Andrus, the current CEO, who's also a principal investor, he came out of Skull Candy with a lot of money. Yep. And then there's another private equity firm, and I don't think they've got that kind of assets. I mean, Weber's not cheap. We're talking several billion probably for yep. a full buyout. Uh, but then again, you know, so I don't think Traeger has those sort of assets. I, I think it's probably more likely that somebody might try to acquire both of them at the same time. But who who could do that? Like, is um, do you think that there's a you know somebody that could step up, or is that a group of people? Well, it would be an equity firm or something like that. But there's a lot of them out there who've got hundreds of billions of dollars burning in their pockets. So you know why not? <laughs> but the thing of it is, is Jeremy Andrews, CEO at Traeger, has said that Traeger will sell when he reaches five hundred million dollars in annual revenues. He's he's said that to several people I know. He's he's said it in interviews. He's he doesn't hide that information. Um, they're saying that they did in the neighborhood of four fifty in 2019. So they're close. Uh, Anders has been with the company for 10 years. He is in the private. He comes out of that private equity sort of thing. He's a he's a CEO mm -hmm. and he I think he's more than ready to move on to his next project. So, uh, yeah, I don't think Traeger is the buyer for Weber because I think Traeger for sale, too. Uh, so we'll see how that unfolds. Uh, yeah. Anything else? Uh, anything else going on in the space you want to talk about before I let you go tonight? Well, I thought you want to talk about Traeger suing Green Mountain Grills. Uh, I don't know anything about that. I mean, we you, can do that. What do you know? You know, you know nothing. Yeah. Know. Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, I got a piece up on my side about the whole thing. Um, so the interesting part of this is that. Uh, about 2016, Traeger filed for two patents. These are what are known as utility patents. They're not about a particular piece of hardware or technology. They're about, in essence, a service. One patent refers to controlling an outdoor, a piece of outdoor cooking equipment via some sort of wireless technology. And the other one is about monitoring. They, um, these patents don't, specify much in what that piece of cooking equipment might be or how that monitoring or control might be done. Now, I know what you're thinking. Green Mountain Grills was selling wireless controlled pellet grills in 2015. You could buy a wireless controller for your Mac grill in 2012. So how could, how could Traeger possibly win a patent for that? Well, they did. They were awarded both of them. Hmm. And this, as soon as they were awarded those patents, they sent out cease and desist letters to multiple companies saying, you are no longer allowed to connect your cooker to a remote device. That's our stuff. We own those patents. You can't do this anymore. Uh, across across the industry. I, I don't know the full extent of the companies who received them. I think many of the companies who did get them may have not said. I know that Rectech and Memphis were in that list, as well as Green Mountain Grills. Mm. Green Mountain Grills then filed with the U.S. Um, Patent Office a complaint that they have been making these grills for years and that their use of this sort of technology predates Traeger's patents. Mm -hmm. That court kind of said, well, you know, I, we don't think this patent will hold. And then last, last October, a panel of judges upheld it, stating that just because Traeger didn't invent the technology doesn't mean they couldn't patent it, since technically no one else had. Hmm. People had patented specific controllers, they had patented specific pieces of equipment, but they hadn't patented the service of connecting the two. So as soon as Traeger had that ruling from the patent courts, 
they filed lawsuit against Green Mountain Grills, stating that they were to stop selling uh, wireless connected grills, and that um, so basically all their Carter- grills. <laughs> Well, yeah. I mean, the outside of the and choice that, line, I mean, a prime line right. and up has Wi-Fi connected uh, capability. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, right. Um, and that Green Mountain Grills owed them restitution. In essence, what would work out to four times the losses to Traeger from the sale of this sort of stuff. Wow. And they also filed with the International Trade Commission. This is a particularly ballsy move to ban the importation or exportation of Green Mountain Grills. Wow. So suffocating them fully. That was the idea. Hmm. Uh, I don't know. The thing of it is, is that the court documents that Traeger filed specifically demand a jury trial and that the trial go forward as quickly as possible. So I don't think they're looking for a settlement here. I don't... I think they believe they've got millions of dollars worth of lawyers and they can take this. And once they have that, once they have this court ruling, they can go to after anyone, anyone who sells a wirelessly connected outdoor cooking apparatus. So that could be be subject master built and uh, the other pellet companies that you had mentioned and, you know, any, anybody else Uh, It could be, uh, uh, they could go after Weber. They could, that would be, that would be the court battle of of like the in, entire industry history. Weber's lawyers are infamous for the shit they've pulled. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, they would have a court ruling. They would have a court ruling saying their pal- their patent was not only valid but it was enforceable. And at that point, they can just extract licensing fees from everyone. Mm-hmm. So it's either going to be pay so, up or get out, potentially. <sighs> Well, I mean, we'll have to see how this goes. Yeah. Uh, there is kind of a notion in in the law that states that anything that would any ruling that would be destructive to a company, a, an onerous burden, as they like to put it, and a threat to the industry itself, may not be ruled in that way. It may require it may actually require settlement, not just a total eradication of all those products. I mean. Weber's not going to dump smoke fire just because Traeger filed patents, you know, after the fact. Yep. But this is uh, this can be an interesting couple of months, I think. Would you say that this is uh, unprecedented in the industry or no? In the industry, yeah. yeah. The, these sort of arguments have been made in the past. Nobody's ever pulled this off in, in, in outdoor cooking, but... Uh, the cable companies have pulled these sort of uh, lawsuits and patent disputes on multiple occasions and ended up paying each other tons of money. So, <laughs> and it's big in the tech firms in the tech world. And, you know, interestingly enough, Traeger is another grill company that tells everyone they're a technology company right. and not a grill company. Well, I mean, look what the lawsuit's right. over. This is about technology, this isn't about hardware yeah. or forging or anything like that. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's it, it's literally like trying to patent an idea. I mean, that's it, it is as close to that as possible. And you can't patent ideas, but mm-hmm. they're kind of pushing the fringe here. And we'll just see how this gets ruled out. All right. So we will keep track on that. Uh, maybe we'll have an update when we catch up with you towards the end of February. In the meantime, you can see what Derek's writing about over at DerekRiches.com. And if you've missed any of his past appearances here on the show, Go subscribe to the podcast feed and find the fourth Tuesday of every month that he has been on, and you will be regaled with great information here in the live fire industry. Derek, always appreciate the time, and we'll see you at the end of February. Yeah, it's good talking to you. See you in a month. There he is, Derek Riches from DerekRiches.com. Big news right there. Holy moly. And as he says, uh, this is like patenting an idea and... We haven't done that. You're not allowed to do that. But this is as close as it's going to be at the moment. Starving out, potentially, those that have Wi-Fi connected devices. We'll see how it rules. I would imagine a Rule 4 Traeger will then embolden. 
a rule against, and then we'll see what happens from there. Uh, Derek Riches will have his finger firmly on the pulse. Before we get into the second hour or we wrap the first hour, I'll talk to you quickly about Big Papa Smokers, the one-stop online shop for all things at barbecue, a curated selection of only the best outdoor cooking and grilling supplies get you on the path to better barbecue results in no time. Big Papa's known for their championship rubs and seasonings, popular flavors like Sweet Money, Cattle Prod, Cash Cow, all proven winners in the competition circuit and in the backyard. 13 perfectly balanced flavors that will transform ordinary meals into extraordinary if you're looking for a new sauce, they own Granny's barbecue sauce as well. You can use it as a base sauce. You can use it as a sauce right out of the bottle. Both fine, however you want to do it. Aside from their premium selection of rubs and sauces, they also offer the very best pellet cookers and charcoal cookers and wood cookers available today, for instance. If you're looking for a versatile cooker that's easy to use, check out the Mac 2 Star General Pellet Cooker. Big Papa's is the exclusive Mac dealer, even offering special packages. If you're not a fan of pellet smokers, you can try the Old Hickory Ace BP. The only charcoal cooker that Big Papa trusts on his competition trailer. If you're not sure of what grill you need, call him and ask questions. 877-828-0727. That's 877-828-0727. Or shop their website at BigPapaSmokers.com. That's B-I-G-P-O-P-P-A Smokers. Com. We are back to wrap the first hour right after this. Stick around. We'll be right back. You're listening to the number one most downloaded barbecue and grilling podcast anywhere. The Barbecue Central Show. Continuing to produce incredibly mediocre content in an exceptionally professional way. You're listening and watching the Barbecue Central Show. Once again, here's your host, Craig Rampey. This portion of the show brought to you by Fireboard 2, Fireboard 2 Drive, and Fireboard 2 Pro. Monitor up to six different temperatures simultaneously. Connect to Wi-Fi for cloud-based monitoring. Or connect via Bluetooth if you have Alexa or the Google Assistant in your home. You're in luck because Fireboard fully integrated with both. Find out more by visiting Fireboard.com or call 816-945-2232. Derek Richards is in the Facebook chat answering questions. So if you want to follow up with him on what we just talked about, go ahead and shoot him a question. Maybe he'll answer it up. All right. Thanks again to Derek for joining me last segment. And thanks to Matt Frampton for joining me before Derek. UrbanSlicerPizza.com is Matt's website. DerekRiches.com is Derek's website. And we'll see how it goes for the lawsuits. I want to know who's going to buy Weber. Who's got that money? Very interested to see that. Derek, should Fireboard be on the lookout? They have cloud-based monitoring for remote thermometers. They're not grills, just, you know, I mean, you know what Fireboard is. Should they be worried? Do I need to shoot Ted a quick email? All right, we're going to uh, step away real quick and load for the second hour and a bridged top, and we'll be off and running. Stick around. We'll be right back. 